It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show. Our mission is to serve you and empower you so you can make better financial decisions in your life. <laughs> After today's Clark Stink segment, I got something you won't want to miss, a way to potentially save a person's life with something found in a lot of bathrooms. But before we get to saving lives, I need to hear where I gave you terrible advice. I started to say something in terms of the bathroom. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Terrible (laughs) advice that I got wrong, in your opinion, in today's Clark Stink segment. You don't stink, Clark, but I did want to reach out and say that I have nearly the same story as the woman whose nest did not work correctly with her heat pump. We have a new HVAC system, which is a heat pump common in our area, and installed a nest. It worked well for a year, but one day in the summer, our AC was pumping out heat. We called our brother who works in HVAC and installed our system, and and he installed our system and received the same diagnosis. Nests don't work correctly and often break when used with a heat pump. As soon as he installed a different thermostat, everything worked perfectly, Lindsay. And I heard from one other person as well. So I have, as I said last time this came up, Lindsay, I have Nest thermostats hooked up to my heat pump. And so I guess the shoe's going to drop and I'm going to say, my Nest messed up too. Yeah, I have one and we've had problems and we had the AC, the HVAC unit fixed like so I'm wondering if we really needed to do that. So we'll see. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and I guess I will find out soon enough mm. if uh, the nest is the wrong choice with a heat pump. Heat pumps are the right choice. And they're more and more common because they reduce your energy consumption bills so much. Sorry to disappoint, but Clark does not stink but he has overlooked a way to send money while keeping your checking account safe. You can fund your Venmo account using your American Express card with American Express Send at no charge. American Express Send is kind of like Venmo, but you can use it with no fees and no need to share your banking information with Venmo. I've not received money on my Venmo, so I cannot tell you how you can retrieve your money if you receive any, but you will certainly avoid credit card fees on Venmo bill. And Have I you tried ever heard this. of American yeah, I, Express Send? Well, I hadn't until I saw this from Bill. So I went in and uh, yesterday and I signed up for it. And he's correct. The one thing is you don't get any of your benefits or points or anything if you use it. But you can sign but up. But it's this. not treated as a cash advance or it's anything not, like that. It's not. And it specifically says that this is not a cash advance. What's in it for American Express? I don't know. Huh. Okay. All right. I'll check it out because that's, that's yeah. a puzzling and potentially... Great opportunity to send money. Thanks, Bill. Okay, a listener complained about shortening their stay at an Airbnb and having to pay more rather than get a refund. The reader said that he shortened his stay from seven to six days. This tells me that the Airbnb guest was getting a weekly discount for the seven days, but then lost that discount when he shortened the stay. As an example, suppose you rented an Airbnb for seven nights at $100 nightly. The total would be $700. If the Airbnb host offers a 25% discount off of weekly stays, that would bring the rental down to $525. But if the guests had originally booked six nights, they would have paid $600. When you change the dates on an Airbnb booking, they either give you a refund or charge you extra as if you had originally booked a new, the new number of nights. This is only fair because imagine how many people would book a place for a month to get the monthly discount, but then shorten their stay down to just a few days. I'm really surprised that Clark was so quick to blame Airbnb for this problem. They do not have an early departure fee. Furthermore, when you make a change on your reservation, they present you with the new total, whether you are going to get a refund or whether you need to pay more before you click the final submit button. Maynard. Another uh, person complaining about what you said about Airbnb. Clark, you've held yourself out to the public as a financial expert for decades, but when talking about Airbnb prices, you've clearly failed basic math. 45% average fees is a nonsense statistic. On the three-bedroom cabin I rent out, the only fee I charge is for cleaning. I separate it out because the cost to me for having it cleaned is $200, and I incur that per stay. If I built it into an average rate, I'd have to charge an extra $100 a night. And how would that be fair to someone booking for a week? Well, I'd also literally be losing cash money on one-night stays. So yes, I have a $200 cleaning fee on my listing, 
And if you're only looking for one night, that's going to be a huge percentage of the overall cost, James. So two very different things brought up by Maynard and by James. So Maynard, your point about a uh, seven-night stay becoming a six-night stay, going from a weekly to a six-night, that's such an interesting scenario where someone is vacating one day early and is happy to pay the what by your guessing was a weekly rate, but then the rate gets recalculated for checking out the one night early. I think you contact the host directly and you check out as agreed in seven days technically, but you only sleep there the six days um, to charge extra when the owner's getting the property back because of change of plans one day earlier seems not fair to the renter. Um, and, but I understand what you're saying, that it's an automatic recalculation. On the thing that you said about the uh, junk fees, I didn't come up with that stat, James. That was in a published report. And it was talking about that the average, if, if an Airbnb lists for X number of dollars, that the average price paid is 45% more. That was a stat in a news story. Um, and if I'm repeating improper stats, I apologize. Yeah, I for wonder that. if they use one night or if they used, you know, a week. They would have to be consistent with the that. The article said that that was the average add on percent. Right, but you think about it like what, what he said. If it's a cleaning fee, that could be more than a night's stay. If you took every situation, you manipulated the data to make it seem as dramatic and awful as possible, you could do what he said about only looking at it as a one nighter. And most people don't stay in an Airbnb one night. So I appreciate that. I think Clark's kids have a right to be upset with, about him making them climb the stairs of the Eiffel Tower because he doesn't want to pay for the tickets. It would be different if he said it was because he wanted to, them to all get exercise or if they wanted friendly competition racing up to the top or if their budget was actually tight. To say that he just didn't want to pay for the tickets because he's cheap is a cop-out. What is the lesson Clark is teaching his children in that moment? Really, Sharky. <laughs> I wish we could have all three of my kids react to that event at the Eiffel Tower because it lives on. That was in 2012. It's now 11 years later and it's still something that lives on is that I didn't want to pay the, you know, you have to pay to enter the Eiffel Tower. I just thought, hey, they're all fit. I, You know, why pay the elevator fee when you're able to walk up the stairs far enough to have just incredible vistas? And so... I was cheap. And you were teaching them to save money, which is good. Well, obviously, none of them have forgotten about it. So it'd be fun to hear from any one, two, or all three of them on this. We heard from so many people about the egg story. Um, and here is one of them. Your egg advice stinks worse than the har a hard-boiled egg sandwich left in a hot car for days. You wondered if nationwide cholesterol levels went down when egg prices were high and people were eating fewer eggs. Although the diet advice in the 90s was that eating eggs led to high cholesterol, research has largely proven the opposite in the past 30 years. Most studies agree you can have one to three eggs a day with no effect on bad cholesterol. Three eggs a day can improve your HDL or good cholesterol. LDL, the bad cholesterol, is formed by your own body's liver. Triglycerides, another form of bad blood cholesterol, forms from eating and drinking too much sugar. Eggs are a very good source of protein for vegetarians and good sources of vitamins essential for eye health. I've owned chickens for years, eat eggs every day, and have excellent cholesterol because you eat a low added sugar diet versus a low cholesterol diet. It saved me tons of money to pay $10 a month for chicken feed and get two dozen eggs a week from my four hens. So before you try to play Dr. Clark and give medical advice, check with legit medical websites. Chelsea, Nutrition Advisor from Rochester, Minnesota. Chelsea, thank you very much. And I stand corrected by you and many other people on what I said about eggs offhandedly. I can't believe how many responses we've had by in every angle mm -hmm. about when I talked about eggs. People were upset about me saying that, that the 
pasture raised eggs are nutritionally superior to regular eggs that are fed feed. Apparently, nutritionally, they're not, but okay. Clark doesn't really stink as I usually. Oh, well, I love that. Okay. It's like, yeah, you have that opinion. I'm still going to eat them. I'm still going to buy the overpriced eggs. Clark doesn't really stink as I usually come out smelling like a rose by following Clark's financial advice over the past 20 years. However, on a recent podcast, I heard Clark say that Amazon tries to hide the fact that most of what they sell is not directly through Amazon, but through third party sellers. That is not true. While watching a streaming service on television, I saw a very prominent and frequently aired ad by Amazon in which a small business owner was demonstrating the fact that she had outgrown her food service kitchen and received a small business loan through Amazon to get a new kitchen so that her business could con- continue growing. Then there was the settlement made, the statement made on air that Amazon sells 60% of its products online for small businesses. Melissa. Melissa, thank you. And... Uh, ironically enough, we addressed this earlier this week that there's a new disclosure requirement that Amazon and all other online sellers have to have that clearly lays out that you're buying from a third-party seller. What Amazon is able to do for the third-party sellers is provide them fantastic fulfillment of their orders, even warehousing them for them, which allows people that are Prime members to get really fast delivery one to three days of third-party sold items in many cases. A lot of people very, very angry about your segment on the national debt. I'm a loyal listener to Clark, but Clark was a bit smelly on this one. He started his podcast with a good summary of our aging population and the challenges facing Social Security, Medicare, and our national debt. Then he proceeded to only discuss possible solutions for Social Security, completely ignoring Medicare. He was also only half right about our national debt. Our Social Security system was set up as a pay-as-you-go entity. That means it's funded by payroll taxes and not from the general revenue of the United States. Our aging population means the system will only be able to pay 75 to 80 percent of current benefits in 8 to 10 years. The Social Security issues have nothing to do with the national debt. Medicare and defense spending have a lot of impact on our national debt. Fixing our debt problems means cutting Medicare spending benefits and defense defense spending and or raising taxes. Please make it clear that Social Security funding is not tied to our national debt and annual budget process. Rob, and then I'll read this one as well. Clark, you can I, can I respond to that one first, or is this one same theme? Uh, it's also about that segment. Uh, let me, I hate to do this, but okay. let me respond yeah, to this first. Okay, so what you said about Social Security is technically correct, but not how it's practically been carried out. The feds don't actually take money and put it, the whole Social Security trust fund thing is a, a accounting gimmick, and the pressures on the federal budget from all the entitlement payments like Social Security and Medicare have, when you look at the overall picture, both have impact. Um, you were right that Social Security will be able to pay somewhere 70 to 80 percent of benefits moving forward if we don't change the funding formula. And you were even more correct on the Medicare thing that Medicare is the biggest hole we face in the federal budget and we have not come up with a workable solution for it and I didn't have a clear great answer on Medicare which is why I said this is where the emphasis needs to be is fixing the problems with Medicare and Social Security although I did not offer a solution on Medicare because I'm still trying to figure that one out myself. Um, I believe we need to spend more on national defense with the dual threats we face from the uh, Chinese and the Russians. And so I just wanted to address Rob's statement first. Let's hear the other one. This um, (laughs) This is one that I heard a lot. Clark, you stinker. How dare you blame seniors for the U.S. deficit spending problem? My husband, 79, who retired only a few years ago, and I, 74, 
paid into Medicare and Social Security throughout our working years. If the government had properly cared for workers' contributions and not borrowed the funds, there would have been more than enough money to meet the needs of seniors. Social Security and Medicare are not entitlements. If we had the option, we would have invested that money ourselves to cover our needs in old age. And you think corruption and waste are not a major cause of our country's financial woes? Clark, take off the rose-colored glasses. Chris. Chris, thank you. And I uh, need to respectfully disagree with you on some of the points you made. Uh, government waste and corruption is actually a tiny part of the problems of the overall federal budget and budget deficit. The thing with Medicare, and I'll be a Medicare recipient before not too many more years, is that with Medicare, for every dollar you and I paid in, will cost the Medicare system $3. So what we're being taxed for Medicare as much as it is, expensive as it is, through our working lifetime is not nearly enough to cover the cost of our health care. Social Security is not, it's not anything, none of this is to blame on you or me who are older Americans. The problem is we're an aging population and we have a smaller and smaller number of people paying in for each person who's retiring and receiving Social Security and Medicare. We have a demographic time bomb that kind of painted us into this corner. Uh, Social Security, as stated in the prior post, is a pay-as-you-go program. In the case of Medicare, there's not enough pay in, paying into the system to be pay-as-you-go. And so that's a real problem and the major problem we have to address. Fixing Social Security is really easy. Fixing Medicare, that's going to require some very smart people, and we're going to have to make some very tough choices. Hey, Clark, you remembered your deodorant today, but I think you forgot your cologne. You said the average person doesn't really need to worry now about AI voice cloning today. But there is one area I think we do need to be concerned, the grandparent scam. Yeah. If a bad guy is able to replicate a grandchild's voice using readily available AI software, then a fake call to a grandparent saying a grandchild is in jail or has been kidnapped could be made to sound all too real with an AI-generated plea from the child for help. That is something all of us need to be aware of, Rick. Rick, thank you for making that point. The grandparent scam is about to get far more dangerous because it will sound to the grandparent like the identical voice of their grandkid. And so what you need to know is the rule stays the rule. If you're contacted by a family member saying they're in trouble, uh, they were in an accident, they're in jail, they were kidnapped, those are the three most common scenarios that happen in this grandparent scam. Your instinct as a grandparent is immediately to help, to send the money, whatever you're told to do. And your heart is speaking at that point, no matter what, even if it sounds exactly like your grandson or granddaughter or whatever. You do not take the bait. It could be a real scenario. So you then say, thank you, I, I've got to call you back. You hang up and then you call your grandson or granddaughter at their cell phone number. And what's going to happen almost always is they're going to answer the phone. They're going to say, hi, what's going on, Grandma? And you say, well, I was just checking to see how you're doing. And they say, I'm fine. And then, then you tell them what the call was. And this is such a common scam because it's been so successful for the crooks. And that's why you don't follow any instructions you've received in that call. You hang up and you place another call. And soon enough, you'll find out, was there really an accident? Is your grandchild really in jail? And in the worst possible and rarest of all circumstances, have they been a victim of a kidnapping? Remember, if they're kidnapped, you're not going to hear from them. You're going to hear from the kidnappers. And again, you don't want to take the bait in any of those cases. And thank you for that post. And thank you all for taking the time 
to post. And I remember when we were having our show planning meeting and I said I knew it was going to generate a lot of anger, but I wanted to talk about Social Security and Medicare. I predicted the future just right. You sure I? did. I mean, we could have taken the whole Clark Stinks and just read people's posts about Social Security and Medicare. And that's why the politicians are afraid. They're cowardly on this. They're unwilling to deal with the unpleasantness of making the two systems sound because they don't want to have to deliver uh, broccoli or asparagus or Brussels sprouts. They want to deliver candy so voters will smile and be happy with them. And so that's why we're fiddling while Rome burns instead of dealing with these problems. The sooner we deal with them, the better. Maybe that will generate more Clark I'm sure Stinks. it will. Clark.com slash Clark Stinks. Coming up ahead, I guarantee you what I'm going to talk about straight ahead is going to generate a lot of feedback, both negative and positive. It involves a bathroom plunger. Okay, I got something completely in the news of the weird. All right, this is way out there. And you're going to freak out. But this goes all the way back to 1988. 65-year-old man was dying. His heart had stopped at home. His wife and son didn't know CPR. And according to the New York Times, they had the craziest idea in the moment as they watched the husband, the father, seemingly going to his death. They took the plunger in the bathroom and started doing compressions on the chest with the plunger. Now, I want to remind you, this is 1988. The man recovered. The doctors at the hospital, San Francisco General, started thinking, huh, a plunger? People who didn't know CPR, how'd they think of that? And an idea was born. But researchers, three decades later, just presented data about the plunger being a potential lifesaver versus CPR. Now, I, um, have you ever had CPR training? I have, yes. Um, I'm, I've, mine's just gone stale. But all through the years that I was in the State Guard, uh, my unit, the Georgia State Defense Force, I had to stay current and do recurrent training on CPR. And truth be told, I was never confident that that training was going to actually pay off in saving somebody's life. And why? Because the reality, only 7% of people who receive proper CPR end up okay after receiving it. 93% either don't survive or never recover mental, cap you know, full mental faculties. And that has led the plunger from 1988, all these years later, has led to the development of a procedure known as neuroprotective CPR that apparently, according to this New York Times story, virtually no one in medicine knows about. It's a lot more advanced for, for a neuroprotective, neuroprotective CPR device than just a plunger, but it starts basically with a medical version of a plunger. It involves a body positioning device it was founded by a doctor that uh, is all about making sure that the patient is in the perfect position for oxygen to flow. 
and the three pieces of equipment. All right, what does a plunger cost if you go buy one? I have no idea. Oh, you know, if you go to a, a discount outlet, it might be a couple of bucks. A really good one will be 15 or $20. One a plumber carries might be $50. Okay, this device, this is so true of medicine, right? What does the, the neuroprotective CPR unit that has three components to it, the plunger that forces the chest up and down, a plastic valve that goes over your face, with a breathing tube, and then the body positioning device. Just want you to guess what the. What I, it costs. I looked over your shoulder, so I know. Twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to have twenty thousand dollar devices in our home. But hopefully, it'll get cheaper. There'll be other, maybe other devices made, right? There will be others, but the point is. Uh, in research that was presented, the survival rate is 10 times greater. 10 times. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, it's incredible. Different studies have found different, uh, different values for that. But in all cases, a significant improvement over the complication of CPR we've been taught over the years. But the oddest thing of all with this is that if you if all else fails and somebody's you know on the floor right there you take that plunger that you got and that you bought for 2 10 20 dollars whatever and you plunge on their chest till the EMTs get there and you may be able to save a life and save full function how wild is that That's i crazy. think of the news that we share from time to time. There's no money advice in this. No. But if you're not alive, it doesn't matter yeah, what money you sure. have. And the reason this spoke to me so much is my, my uh, concern that with my training that I still wouldn't be able to save somebody. Yeah, for sure. And if, if a simple plunger could be the difference between life and death. Who knew? It's crazy. It's great. Eric in Pennsylvania wrote in and said, my under warranty coil ruptured in my six-year-old heat pump system. This caused all the expensive refrigerant to leak out. The HVAC system ma manufacturer is willing to cover the cost of the ruptured coil, but none of the related fees, such as service visits, diagnostics, labor, or the 14 pounds of new refrigerant needed to ch charge the system. The total expense of repairing this in warranty coil is thirty-seven hundred dollars. You got to be kidding! I thought replacing a coil is less than that. I don't think thirty-seven hundred dollars. Yes, I don't think I should have to pay all the related expenses of a failed in warranty part. I did contact the manufacturer, and of course, got the "so sorry, but we cannot help you" response, other than covering the cost of the coil. Advice on how to proceed would be greatly appreciated. So, Eric, I don't know how active you are on social media, but it would be really great if you started uh, posting about this. If you are active on social media about it, see what other people have experienced uh, with a um, in-warranty coil. That sounds like a shockingly high number at $3,700 when the coil itself is being replaced um the manufacturer manufacturers in the heating and air conditioning industry are really all about protecting their dealers dealers vary in quality i would like you to call other um heating and air conditioning contractors and say hey i, I think my coil's bad it's going to need replacing but it's under warranty what's it cost for the service visit and whatever else i need what's typical that it would cost you will be able to get a real sense is 3700 because i mean we're out of my area of knowledge that it sounds way out of line i don't know the refrigerant and everything else but i don't know i mean you ask you you ask others in the industry and you'll get a sense did you get ripped off I mean, obviously, it feels completely like a ripoff, 
but is that price uh, similar to what other people might quote you? Or if you find out from other people, oh, well, yeah, the service visit, blah, 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 that might be $1,200, let's say. And then you got charged $3,700. You got a real problem with the place that did the work. And uh, I think you post, if you find out that there's enormous disparity between what you were charged and what it should be in the marketplace, you go on various sites and you post reviews on Google, on Yelp, and any others about the company that did the work that you find out by your research did potentially take advantage of you price-wise. On the other hand, if the price quotes are generally in the range of what you were charged, which is, seems outrageous, then it's one of those things in life where it's just shocking how much things can cost, even in the event that you have a parts warranty not including labor. So that's what, it, okay, it doesn't include labor. I was going to say I would go to the BBB and complain. Yeah, but with uh, HVAC warranties, normally you have a parts and labor warranty for a short period of time, parts warranty a lot longer. Okay. And you end up with a meaningful bill even when a component is under warranty. But that amount sounds scary crazy. HC in Connecticut says, my 13-year-old daughter has earned a few hundred dollars in commissions from sales of her paintings at a local gallery show. Isn't that awesome? I know. And I'd like to invest that in a Roth IRA for her. Do these art commissions count as income that she can invest into a Roth? And if so, where would you recommend I open the account for her with this small sum as a start? All right. I love this, love this, love this. Um, normally you would take the expenses she has for canvases and art supplies and stuff like that and offset them against the income. Don't do that in this case. You want to report all the income essentially. And she's got a few hundred dollars. You can go to Fidelity Investments, open a, a Roth IRA, a youth Roth IRA, and put that money in. You'll be the custodian of the account and put it in um, the Fidelity. It's the Target Index Fund that has a special name. But they have Target Funds. They have one that's an index version and one that's not. You want the index version. And uh, the reason I say Fidelity instead of Vanguard or Schwab, Fidelity has such an emphasis on offering investment accounts for teenagers. And that's why I want fidelity to be the choice for this and you open it up and then she can add to it over time in that fidelity roth ira and then eventually it becomes her discretionary account meaning that it's you're no longer the custodian once she's an adult and it's her money that she's already had the ability to start growing at 13 years old and I just love that so very much. And I'm looking up right now. Is it the Freedom, the, the Fidelity Freedom? That's it. Fidelity Freedom Index Funds. Is that, that shouldn't be that hard for me to remember. And it'd be the last year of freedom, which would be like 2065, 2070, something like that at this point, is the one that your money should go into. Christine Georgia says, I wanted to share a story to affirm your belief that kids can learn money management early and encourage your listening parents to start the process. My husband has always been frugal and started planning for our retirement before we even got married. He got even more serious about it when he started listening to you over two decades ago. Then came four children. He has hammered financial responsibility, saving and investing and living below our means in their heads since they were young. As soon as the older three got jobs in their middle teens, he had them open IRAs and showed them the gro growth potential. They have been diligent about contributing as they continue to work, and they are excited to see their money grow. Our fourth child, our 14-year-old, recently got her first job. The first thing she asked was... Wait, wait, wait. 14? Yep. What is that? That's one year younger than I always made my kids get their first yep. real job. That's really something, 14. The first thing she asked was, can I open a retirement account like my siblings? So, of course, she now has her own IRA. The young people are listening. Thanks for all you do, Clark. I absolutely adore this. And, you know, 
your husband, Christy, has to be so, so proud of the kids all having the attitudes about money. I find that in the same household, kids have very different attitudes about money one to another, but your kids have got it, and it will change the trajectory of their lives, creating so much financial independence over time. Having built that habit young, live on less than what you make, and build up that money uh, with it compounding repeatedly over their lifetimes, it creates a whole different financial security down the road. I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And if you enjoyed our podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a review. And if you don't like it, visit Clark.com slash Clark Stinks. And remember what we're about. It's all about what you just heard in that last post. You learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off. Have a great one.